I love lovely stories about children, and I'm very excited. My daughter is a mother. It was very weird to think to make that corpse today. A mother was walking with a four-year-old daughter, and as she was walking with her mom, she picked up something from the ground and put it in her mouth. And the mother said, please don't do that. Don't put these things in your mouth. And then she said, but why, mom? She says, well, it's dirty. It's filthy. You're not allowed to put things in your mouth. She says, why? Well, there's germs and all kinds of things that can really affect your health. And the little girl looked at her mom and she says, oh, that's interesting. Wow, mom, you know a lot of stuff, eh? So her mom says, absolutely. She says, yes, um, mom knows a lot of stuff. And then she says, but how do you know these things? She says, well, it's on the mommy test. Really? She says, yeah, it's on the mommy test. And before you can be a mother, you need to know these things. And so eventually they walked in silence for a few moments And it was as if a little light bulb came in the child's heart. And she looked and she says, oh, I get it. So if you don't pass the test, you now can be a daddy. (laughs) I really love that. (laughs) Children are so innocent. They are just so gorgeous and they are so perceptive. I want you to think back of your mother or any mother that played a massive role in your life. You know, when I was preparing for the lesson, I was thinking about the fact that this book that we have has sustained cultures for thousands of years. And what makes the Bible so unique is that God weaves his story and his providence into the lives of humans. And so we find in the Bible tremendous examples of amazing women that just changed the lives of nations and changed the lives of so many people. I literally had to battle to delimit the kind of women or the women and find relevance in which was going to be selected. And so I'm really going to run through just a few and hopefully it will be very helpful by way of encouragement to you. If we look through the eyes of Scripture, it is such an important thing to honor your mother that God would have written it in Scripture. He wrote it in the law of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12 and said, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, I'm not quite sure if maybe it is something to do with longevity or maybe that your parents could take you out if you are out of line. But the idea is God wants us to honor our parents. And I would imagine that would be the first port where authority and respect for authority is taught. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 22 says, Do not despise your mother when she is old. And I really love that because I grew up in a cultural environment in Namibia where you respect your older. You respect them. You look after them. You make sure that they are always taken care of. You make sure that they are never neglected. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. And of course, Proverbs 31, which is often used in reference to women. And for completion's sake, I'm going to read it so that you get the full gist of the admiration around the character of a woman. And Solomon writes of his mom, and he said, A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark, provides food for her family and portions for her servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds a distaff and grasps a spindle with her fingers. 
She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household. For all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And then the last portion of this text, Solomon says, Give her the reward she has earned. Let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And the idea here is is that mothers and women are very highly regarded within the economy of God. 300 times the word motherhood is used in some form or the other all over Scripture, especially in the King James Version. But there are some things far more important, far more of lasting significance for mothers. And that is the idea that mothers make a difference. The question on the table this morning is, why should we honor our mothers? Genesis chapter 4, we find an amazing scripture and a story of a mother. We know she was married to Adam, but there was something about her that made her completely different. I want you to know also that her name Eve means life or living. And I want you to understand also, and just to think back, and also affirm that mothers brought us into this world. It is still, the jury is still out that men can father babies. It's just not going to happen. Maybe in some obscure future it might, but for now, mothers are raising children. They nurture us, they provide for us, and they raise us up. What is amazing, I've been watching younger mothers this past few weeks how they instinctively and intuitively rise up to make sure that the child that is placed in their care has got the amount of food and nurturing that it needs to have. Child's nappies are changed on time. And eventually, intuitively, the minute a child cries, the mother can differentiate whether it's a cry for a wet nappy or even if it's just hungry. Eve had three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And we find in in Genesis chapter 4, round about verse 22, that it is through Seth's lineage that, again, people started calling on the name of the Lord. There's a wonderful poem which I want to read for our mothers this morning, and especially mothers who want to change this world. I look at this world that we are in at the moment, and yes, we are facing massive challenges, but I have never seen a mother who's not risen to that challenge. So here's to you. It was William Ross Wallace who wrote the following. Woman, how divine your mission, here upon our natural sod. Keep, oh keep the young heart open, always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. If you read through history, if you read through the entire annals of very famous men, we talk about Napoleon Bonaparte, we talk about Alexander the Great, we talk about Caesar, no matter who they are, you will always find a very strong mother behind the scenes guiding her children, guiding her son. Abram Lincoln once said, All that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. And the question on the table here this morning is for all our mothers. Are you, as a mother, calling on the name of the Lord? Are you raising your children to be sensitive to the voice of God that gently calls them to worship Him? That the children will not live a shallow life in the flesh, but a life that is transcendent, 
a life that is transcendently spiritual that only God can give them. Not to allow the children to live in the shallow world which is filled with hopelessness and greed, but to live in a world that is filled with joy and filled with anticipation, that despite the difficulties of the world, they see the transcendent God that has overcome the greatest challenges this world has ever, ever had to face, even death. Another mom, woman I'd like for us to look at is Jochebed. And that is the mother of Moses, and we find her in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. We know that she gave birth to a boy child, and Scripture tells us that he was a fine child. We also know that she hid him for three months because the leaders of that town, Pharaoh, wanted to kill all the boy children. He watched and saw the proliferation of the nation of Israel, and then he wanted them all dead. And he wanted them drowned. He wanted them killed. And then what Jochebed did, she wove a papyrus basket, coated it with tar and pitch. She placed a child in it, gave it to her daughter. And she then went and gave it, passed it on so that it would get into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. I want you to note as well that a mother's love transcends cultural boundaries. A mother's love will see a child of whatever nation, but she sees vulnerability and instinctively her instinct kicks in that this child needs care. And we watch the opposite of that, that Pharaoh's daughter came and picked up this little baby and made sure that this baby was cared for and she fell in love with this child. We know the story that Miriam was tasked to find a woman that can look after this particular baby. And Miriam went and found Jochebed, the child's mother. And even beyond that, they paid her to look after her own child. What a blessing God can have in working things out for good. And so God even recognizes within the midst of trouble that he'll make sure that his children are taken care of. Mothers are the most amazing and got the most incredible capacity. They will protect us in many ways. Physically from danger. Morally, they will teach us right from wrong. Emotionally, they will teach us about sorrow and regret. Spiritually, they'll bring us up in the nurturing and benediction of the Lord. You see, if you think very carefully... I want you to think back of the mother that has played a massive role in your life. A mother that has instinctively and intuitively worked and shaped your spiritual well-being. And so I'm going to give you 10 seconds, literally in silence and prayer, to think about that mother. I want you to bring her to mind. And I want you to think about her that is impacted for you and pray and thank God that he's brought her your way. Ten seconds, starting now. As you think about her and you thank God for the woman that played the massive role in your life. I want you to move with me to Hannah. And we move to Hannah because she's a praying and supportive mother. Hannah was Elkanah's wife. He loved her so much that whenever he went to do the sacrifice, he would give her a double portion of what he would have sacrificed. But there was one problem. She was barren. She couldn't have children. And what she did was, which typically is of a mother, she would go and she would literally go and speak to her father. I want you to know that in those days when a mother did not have children or a woman didn't have children, she was kind of seen as a second-rate woman. And yes, typical where a godly man like Eli comes to her and rather than encourage her and maybe even pray with her, he then starts criticizing her. I want you to listen to her prayer as she wept bitterly before the Lord. 
She cried, and in her cry, she made a promise to God. And she says, Lord, if you remember me and give me a son, I will give him to you for all the days of his life, and he will be a Nazarite. No razor will ever be used on his head. I want you to hear about this man, just how he viewed this woman crying before a holy God. How he viewed her. He said to her that she was drunk and he scolded her. And then she turns around and says to him, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking. I'm not a wicked woman. But I'm pouring out my soul to the Lord in anguish and in grief. Eli said to her, and I would imagine it was an awakening for him. Whatever you've asked of the Lord, he will grant you. And that night, E. Alcana made love to his wife, and the Lord remembered, and he gave her Samuel. You see, a few years later, she went to God, and she gave him back to God as she promised. I want you to understand the dynamic and the principle in there which is of a huge spiritual significance for all of us. Remember, the children we have been given has been given to us as a sacred trust. And you and I have got every obligation to make sure that this child goes back to God and that this child understands the way back to God because he watches how you and I walk that road to God. In the first place, God answers prayers regarding children. The question on the table is, what are you praying for, mothers? What do you ask God for every single day? What do you pray for when your children walk in on you, when you are on your knees before a holy God? What do you ask of God? Do you go to him with a shopping list of things that he must give you? Or do you go to him and ask him to spiritually enrich and endear and draw your children near to him? This specific aspect of my lesson checked my prayers last night before I slept. And I kid you not, I said to the Lord, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the roof over my head. And then I stopped and I said, Lord, thank you that you've sent your son. Thank you that I can be considered as part of your beloved. That I know you've given me all spiritual blessings that you have bestowed upon those who love you. Thank you that I have an inheritance in you. No matter what physically happens on this world financially, you have got an inheritance that no man can steal, deprive, or take away. Safely guarded by you. Can I ask you a question? Do you ask God, what do you want my child to be? My Lord, do you find a place where my child can fit in to your kingdom? where he or she can serve you for the rest of their life. Secondly, we learn to support our children in not only learning about God's will, but doing God's will. The idea is asking, wow, Lord, will you use my child when he or she grows up? Lord, what do you want my child to do specifically for you that he has been designed by you to do? And the question is a loud cry. Do you and I ask those questions of God? Do you ask God, Father, make me sensitive that I will not inadvertently in my quest to have my child function physically in this world miss the spiritual significance that this child must have for you? I remember as a child, and I've mentioned it many times before, I had the privilege of visiting my grandfather's brother's farm in the Kalahari the other day. And I remember distinctively the prayers every single night that him and his my, oh, my grand prayed for us. They would pray every single night for us by name. In Namibia the same, I would hear them implore God and ask God to keep us safe. 
Let me share something with you very quickly. Before my grandmother passed away, I sat and held her hand. And I spoke to her and my wife had met Sue. Because in our environment, you bring your wife to be to meet your grandmother. And as I was sitting with my grandmother, I spoke to her and I said, What is the greatest desire on your heart? And what do you go to bed with every night praying for? And she was praying for my cousin that has gotten lost in Rundu many years ago. Two years ago, they found him in Pretoria. But I remember my grandmother praying for him every single day that he be kept safe. You see, the prayers of a grandmother is highly significant. The prayers of a mother is highly significant. We know about the story of Timothy, about his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And we find that her faith transferred into the life of her child that was an evangelist. The question on the table is today, do we find the story of Jesus intriguing to teach our children? Encouraging to talk to them about this God that is eternal? Or do we find it an optional extra when it comes to Sunday school? Oh no, we can, they can miss that. Allow me just as a father to speak to you, mothers. You know, on a Sunday morning, there are other mothers that sacrifice to teach our children. They work very hard. Many of them have secular positions during the work, work week. And they prepare the lessons and the crafts for not your children. They are our children. And then they come and they arrive here and our children are not there. You know what? I want to encourage you this morning. You are crucially part of that dynamic. You see, we all know that we must worship God. But the way that our children learn to know about God is through the richness of the stories of Scripture. And when you and I only bring them to worship and they get half the lesson of the day, we deprive them of half of the shaping of their theoretical background and worldview of who God is. I want to move right on to the loyal mother of John, 1925 to 27. The idea that Jesus Christ, the mother of Jesus, watched her child as he was crucified. And she stood there. She watched how her son had to be crucified by evil men. Because he was doing the will of his father. And she said nothing. But what she did do, and Jesus Christ responds to that. He was loyal to his mom. And he said to John, John, please look after my mother. You see, mothers don't give up on their children. I know of mothers and my own mother. My sister was wayward and there was not one single day that I did not hear her imploring God. And there were many mornings I would wake up hearing her cry. And I would go and I would sit next to her and kneel as she begged God to save the life of her child. It came true last year, and she's free of the stuff that held her back. Mothers never give up on their children. Mothers never disown their children. They'll always have a home to come to, but they will never condone the sin. Mothers gave us life. They cared for us and protected us. They pray and support us. They instruct us in the way that we should go. And then also you have the mother sometimes that loses a child. There was a story of a 35-year-old mother that made a request of a Garth Brooks psalm called The Dance. She lost her son two years prior to leukemia. And she asked that they dedicate the song to him. And then the song was played for him. And then the person asked her a question and said, would you have preferred for the baby not to have been born and she said oh no oh no she said i would have had him anyway would you have to have give him life she said yes 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 i could have missed the pain she said 
but I would have missed the dance. Let me read this song to you. I'm not going to sing it. Looking back on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above, for a moment all the world was right. How could I ever known you would say goodbye? Holding you, I held everything. For a whole moment wasn't I a king. If I had only known how the king would fall, then who's to say, you know, I might have changed it all. But now I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end and the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I would have missed the pain. I could have missed the pain, but I would have missed the dance. And here's the key. A mother has got the capacity given by God to endure so much, so much for us. And I today think of my own mother that I had to lay to rest about 10 years ago. And I honor and respect her so much for what she has done for us. So today, mothers, as we honor you with some tea and cake across the way, may God bless you. May he hold you in the hollow of your hand. And all of us who are still blessed with our mothers, I encourage you today to tell them just how much you love them. Let's sing our final song of encouragement for this morning.